Hello everyone arriving in. We have 30 people and counting so far and that is going up very, very quickly. Just make sure that our live stream is also working and it looks like it is. Perfect. Okay, well, before we begin this evening, um, as always, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands on which we are all meeting here this evening. Um, my name is Hannah Ma. I will be uh, facilitating the Q&A at the end of the, uh, the webinar this evening, and I'm coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I would like to pay my respects to all elders past and present. Um, and I would also like to extend a particularly warm welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us here this evening. Uh, I'd also like to invite each of our panellists to introduce themselves with the land that they're on when, uh, when they speak. Uh, and of course, for you at home as well, um, I invite you to share the lands that you're on in the chat, because no matter where we are all zooming in from this evening, all across Australia, we are all on First Nations land and sovereignty of that land was never ceded. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special webinar, The Senate, the room where it really happens. I'm now going to hand you over to our host for this evening, Dr. Scott Birchall, who is Honorary Fellow in International Relations at Deakin University. And before that, he was a political officer at DFAT and has also taught at the University of Melbourne, Monash and the University of Tasmania. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Anna. Um, it's great to be with you and great to have the uh someone with expertise in IT to coordinate and hold our hand through the whole process because um, that makes my life a lot, a lot easier. Um, what I'll just quickly do in a moment is introduce the um, six participants. Uh, then I'll very briefly say a, a few things about the Senate and the setup of the Senate leading up to this election in 15 days time. And then uh, begin with some questions. And then later on in the hour, I think towards the uh, 45 minute mark, we'll have questions from the uh, audience for individual panelists or all of them. Um, so we'll start uh, just to identify people so everyone knows uh, who everyone is, uh, is and where they're coming from, which states they're representing or hoping to represent in the Senate uh, on the 21st. And that is starting with, starting with Jane Caro in, uh, from New South Wales. Um, I won't read you all your biographies because we'll never get through them all and we'll all be finished. But Jane's from New South Wales. Uh, Rex Patrick is from uh, South Australia. He's the only one of us who's a current senator. And so as this is a half Senate election, he's up for renewal, I guess, is the way you sort it, Rex. Um, uh, I'll say a bit more about half Senate elections in just a second. And um, then from the ACT, we have uh, Kim Rubenstein, and we have uh, David Pocock, so two distinguished people from the ACT vying for the Senate this time. And uh, so welcome to Kim and to David. Then uh, down in Tassie, we've got Leanne Minchell, who is uh, standing. Are you in Hobart, Leanne, or in uh, where, where, whereabouts are you? Uh, yes, near Paluna, Hobart. Ah, okay. I spent a couple of years in Sandy Bay. So um, not far. And finally, um, Susan Benedica from Victoria. Hello. So uh, we're represented right around the country, which is terrific. The only, um, the only, just no one from Western Australia, but they're all probably still in there having their afternoon delights at the moment. So we'll miss, we'll come back to them some other time, hopefully. Let me just say a couple of things about the Senate and the setup and why we're actually meeting in, as this group. The Senate as it was structured with the constitution back in the beginning of the 20th century, established the house as a house for states, state representatives. The idea being that the states would have, uh, it was a compromise, if you like, to give the states their own house in the federal parliament. It almost never functioned that way. And the reason it never functioned that way is the party system took over and people's loyalties as members of the Senate were to their parties primarily with, with also, of course, the state um, being the, um, the one that, where they had to be elected. But functionally, they were representatives of parties rather than states. So the party system effectively corrupted the notion that the House, we call the Senate, could be a state's representative House. 
Then it be- its role became the House of Review, um, copying essentially what the House of Lords de- does in London, the idea being that legislation was thought to be primarily generated in the House of Representatives and reviewed by the Senate before it became law. And uh, that's still largely uh, a primary function of the Senate. Um, a lot of the work of senators is to review and amend, if necessary, or uh, vote against legislation coming up from the House of Representatives, uh, which is um, uh, obviously a very key functioning for governments to get their legislation through. Um, the Senate, of course, sits for, uh, you get elected for six years, but only half the Senate comes up for election every six years, uh, unless there's a double dissolution when all seats are declared vacant and everything is, uh, um, is uh, up for grabs. Now, the function of the fact that we're starting with a half Senate election actually gives minor parties and independents a huge advantage because um, in a sense, there are quotes, uh, quotas and uh, um, amounts of the number of votes that you need is, is somewhat easier to achieve in a half cent election than in a double dissolution. And um, so that leads me to my final sort of introductory point, and that is the notion that if, uh, if the Senate was controlled by people before us tonight, that somehow that would represent chaos and instability. Well, you're effectively describing the way the Senate has functioned for the almost in most people's living memory. And that's another way of saying that it is now almost impossible to believe that a major party would achieve a majority in the Senate. I mean, they're struggling this time around, probably struggling to get a majority in the House of Representatives, the former government. But the prospect of getting a majority of seats for one of the major parties in the Senate has not been achieved since the 1960s. As I think I'm pretty right in saying that. So um, as the minor parties and independents have proliferated over the last two decades. That prospect has receded to the point where it's almost impossible to conceive. And that's why we have you there tonight right in front of us, because it gives people a chance to bypass the major parties, to protest against the major parties who don't, they don't feel are representing them properly, and to have disproportionate influence over the shape of legislation that goes ultimately to law. Because um, obviously, if a government doesn't have a a majority in the Senate, it must negotiate with minor parties and independents to get that legislation through. And that means getting people like you on side uh, to either amend or um, strike some agreement to pass individual pieces of legislation. That is not the same as saying that the Senate is chaotic. It just means that the process, if anything, is more detailed and that legislation is under even greater scrutiny than it otherwise would be if block voting essentially decided if bills became law. So we're actually going to get, as with independents and minor parties in the Senate, a much more specific focus on what um, uh, the legislation does, the implications of it, because obviously the independents who end, end up passing this legislation have to wear it as the government does. Their name is going to be associated with it. And we know from recent history that some senators have been criticised for allowing legislation through that might otherwise not seem to be consistent with their own particular views. So that's the setup. The Senate is, uh, is open to independents and minor parties and uh, Obviously, Senator Patrick is a perfect example here of someone who has achieved uh, got a seat in the uh, Senate um, as an independent and therefore able to represent South Australia without being uh, effectively cajoled or disciplined or uh, controlled by a major party. And that opportunity obviously exists for everyone here tonight as well. So if we could just start with a, you've heard enough from me, let's start with a sort of first question, which I think is probably what people want to hear, and that is why you are standing for the Senate in, uh, on the 21st of May. Because as you know, um, and as you've already experienced, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, lots of money is required. Sometimes lots of uh, volunteers are required. Lots of help and support is required. And to generate that, 
as an independent without the backing of a political party is a tough road. So perhaps if we could start with Susan, can you just summarise why you've decided to stand for the Senate on this occasion? Um, two reasons, Scott, and I think you've articulated the first. The fact that it's a house of review and people actually need to come together, debate legislation, perhaps they need to amend it or send it out to an inquiry or scrutinise it in some way. So you actually get a lot of voices working together, collaborating, trying to work out what's the best way to get that legislation through. But the story of my um, decision making occurred at the uh, 2020, the bushfires were still on. I live in Northeast Victoria normally. So normally I'm coming from Bangarang country. Today we've had a personal a, a family loss. So I'm now a Gadigal country. So just need to get that right. But living in Northeast Victoria, surrounded by smoke, having a coffee with a friend and complaining bitterly that eight months before the emergency fire commissioners had come together to try and warn our government that we were going to face the worst summer in history. That had not been heard. No meeting had been held. And here we were. At that stage, I had four members of my, four parts of my family in different evacuation camps. That anger was huge. And my friend challenged me and said, well, what are you going to do about it? Uh, you've got to stand up, you've got to speak up, you've got to do something. And I have a representative role in many of the the works that I do through my business and through chairing roles. So it's time to stand up and stand up to do something. Okay. Thanks, uh, Susan. Leanne, what, uh, what possessed you to sentence yourself to six years of life in Canberra? <laughs> um, well, I've got um, two short answers. So from a broad perspective, like on a meta level, I was actually looking at the way that our democracy was travelling and I wasn't happy with it. And I felt that in a lot of ways, as citizens, we'd abrogated the responsibility to govern ourselves to an ever-shrinking pool of people captured by a party system that was toxic. And I thought um, I quite naively and stupidly started an independent Independence network and then called it a party, which has caused no amount of confusion. Um, and that's the local party. So we started the local party. After this election, we'll actually change it to the local network. It will make life a lot easier because in our constitution, every single person gets their own vote on every piece of legislation. So there's never the potential for that, um, the culture that we see in traditional party structures to start to seep in as we grow. Um, all you have to do is believe in climate, want to take action on it, sign on to the Uluru Statement from the Heart and commit to holding two citizen juries a year. So that's the meta level. And then for this Senate race, I looked at it and I thought, Jesus Christ, Tasmania is going to be really important to the Senate and also the ACT because I looked at the way that the Senate, and as well with you, Rex, obviously South Australia, but um, I was looking at where are the opportunities to get what I would say a safer Senate. So in my, in some might say more progressive, but, and in Tasmania, I knew that that six, the sixth seat would go to, um, really it was going to be UAP, Pauline Hanson, Jackie Lambie, or the third uh, person on the Liberal ticket, which has ended up being Erica Betts. So I thought I'm going to put myself forward as an alternative to their politics because mine's very different. Um, and if I was managed to get into the Senate, I would like to help um, the government, if it's an ALP government, this is my view, be as brave as it can be. Um, and if it's not, um, then hold an LNP government to account and really push as hard as I can and continue to do a lot of my community work. So uh, here we are two weeks out. <laughs> seriously thinking what the hell i hope other people are feeling like that as well thanks yeah i think if you didn't don't feel like that there's probably something really seriously wrong with you but, um, yep. david uh, you're already in the act so you don't have far to go um if you get into the parliament um what would you um what's decide what's uh, why for the move down the road what what do you want to achieve and what's the motive thanks scott I, i'm coming for you from, from canberra none of all country um you know, like so many people, I've been frustrated with politics and the lack of action on the big issues that, that really matter to us, the politicisation of issues, the, the, the mudslinging, the point scoring, rather than actually moving forward and actually finding some sort of pragmatic way forward. And it seems to me that the, 
non-career politicians and a bunch of independents have actually been showing us what politics could look like. You know, Senator Patrick, uh, Helen Haynes in Indi, Zali Stegel in Warringah, are the ones actually talking about issues around transparency and integrity and climate. And so I think there's a really important role for independents to play. And having said that for a number of years, last year I was asked by a number of people here in the Canberra community if I would put my uh, hand up and figured it was time to put my money where my mouth was and, and put my hand up was endorsed by the voices of group here in Canberra. And it's been a wild ride, but really enjoyable, uh, loving it. And uh, yeah, it'll be a big couple of weeks. Well, you're only half time, remember, you've still got a couple of weeks to go. So um, enjoy the ride. Now, Rex, why have you gone? What do you want to go back and do it all again for? Oh, look, I, uh, I guess I start from a different, uh, different position because I am in the Senate uh, and I came to the Senate as an accidental senator. Uh, I, I never really pursued a, a, or wanted a career in politics. I uh, was uh, concerned about a, a, a particular issue. I was a submariner and I was interested in the future submarine program. That sort of got me tied up uh, working in Canberra. I ended up working for Nick Xenophon and when he... Uh, when he um, decided to um, uh, retire from the Senate, uh, I, I took his place. So uh, accidental senator, sort of with an engineering background, I uh, perhaps don't fit very well there, and that's maybe why I, I do a lot of things that are different. Now, in terms of running again, obviously I know exactly uh, what I'm um, in for. Uh, I'd say there's two things uh, that I would observe um, about the Senate. And one of them is the fact that uh, when the bells ring and you look up on the clock and there's a, a red light or a green light flashing, if the green light's flashing, I already know what the vote uh, outcome's going to be because almost always the government win a vote in the, in, in, the, in the House. When the red bell rings, it's a bit of a lottery. And what that means is uh, you can have a real influence in the Senate, a real influence over big issues uh, in in uh, in a balance of power situation. So where the Labor Party uh, doesn't agree with the, with the government, uh, then uh, you really have to get in, get look at the legislation, and you may end up, as I have in some circumstances, uh, passing uh, the casting vote. Um, uh, and it's because of that you not just in the legislation front, you can cause changes in in other areas. So. Um, uh, I'd also differentiate the House. There are people that are running in the House, uh, independents. Uh, I'd differentiate the House and the Senate by saying that uh, people who represent a, an electorate might focus on uh, a lot of lower level issues that are important to their constituents, like it might be roads or, or some aspect of infrastructure, whereas in the Senate we you tend to look at things from a much higher level because it's a state, a state view on things. And so you tend to deal with big issues in, in the context of education, health, defence, foreign affairs, uh, really, really big issues. And uh, that's a very, very interesting place to work. Thanks, Rex. Um, now, Jane, if you're successful, you're going to get a lot of uh, co invitations to cocktail parties and uh, you're going to find a whole lot of friends you never knew you had trying to court you. Are you ready for that? Uh, well, yes, I suppose I am. I do like a cocktail party and I don't mind being courted. Um, but I am also determined that um, the ideals that I've held all my life, I will take with me into the Senate. I mean, I'm 65 in June. I'm too old to change my ways now. And uh, I know uh, why I decided to nail my colours to the mast, um, because I have been very vocal, very active, um, very much part of the political discussion, I think, for quite a long time about a lot of things like uh, women's equality and rights, uh, public education, climate change, you know, uh, the big kind of issues of the last 20 years I've been engaged with. But I have not really seen the dial move in the direction that I would hope that it would have. And, in fact, I've rather more watched and feel that a lot of it is sliding backwards. 
Um, so when Reason rang me and asked if I would consider standing as their candidate in the Senate, I think I had a little bit of a, a kind of a talk to myself, I face myself in the mirror. Are you going to continue sniping from the sidelines or are you going to get out there and take the risk of standing yourself and uh, trying to get in? And, of course, I'm standing in New South Wales, which, like Susan standing in Victoria, is a much bigger and tougher uh, gig than if you're standing for one of the smaller states or indeed in the ACT. Even though I, I do acknowledge, Kim and David, there's only two senators in the ACT, whereas there's six in New South Wales and the other states. But nevertheless, I also feel very, and I had a level of disgust about the whole um, integrity in government, the sort of um, casual acceptance of the sports rorts, parking station rorts, the scandals, the sexual scandals, the payoffs, the giving of tenders to uh, companies that had existed for a minute and a half and operated out of a tin shed. All that sort of thing really infuriated me and I just started to feel like we had the wrong people um, in the positions of power, but they weren't actually looking out for the, 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 the future of Australia and to, to safeguard the public. In fact, I felt a bit the other way around. Um, and I feel very, very strongly that if, as some of the polls are saying, that corruption, a federal ICAC, um, integrity in government is the number one issue that is actually engaging Australians, then I'm putting it really bluntly. If that's true, then we have to vote this government out. We have to change the, the um, really the makeup of the people in our parliament because if we don't, then basically all we've said to them is go right ahead, continue doing what you're doing because we it's not bad enough. We don't care about it enough to actually have consequences for that behaviour. So I feel like this is a really, really pivotal election, not just about things like climate change and uh, women's rights and women's safety, but actually about do we want to descend into even more um, cronyism, corruption, um, and, you know, rule by privileged and entitled few. So I just felt that it was my duty to put my hand up, and so I did. Okay, thank you. And Kim, you only have to go down the road as well. I do. Uh, a short really. distance. Um, yeah. Why do you want to do that? So, Scott, to um, answer, I can amplify a little bit about your background too about the Senate because the ACT is very interesting. Um, both the ACT and the Northern Territory only got Senate representation in 1975 and that Senate representation is not a six-year term, it's a three-year term. So yeah, it's yeah. Uh, for, for us here in the ACT to go up every, every uh, election. Mm -hmm. And um, I think... That also reflects the changed nature of the Senate. And one of the things that I'm really committed to doing is to actually increase the number of senators for the ACT to four, which is also about the duopoly that the ACT has had of the parties over and taking the ACT for granted. So that, that framework is interesting about the nature of the Senate, but is also interesting about the particular value add that we can bring in from the ACT. And as you said, um, given that there isn't going to be a majority, and in fact, the last majority um, parliament was the Howard Parliament, the 41st Parliament from 2005 to 2008. That was when we last had that scenario. And that led to a backlash, really, because of that overreach over work choices legislation and so forth. But seeing that opportunity of not only um, the, the, the reality that an independent could be elected here in the ACT, but that role that it would play to not only strengthen ACT representation, but to have a real voice in the national agenda, um, spoke to me because for the last 25 years as a university teacher, as an advocate, I have been advocating for the issues that are so central to the future of our democracy. And this moment is one that I felt I couldn't let pass by. But like Leanne, in the knowledge of the difficulties for an independent in a, a Senate, even in a small territory like the ACT, I formed the Kim for Canberra Party last August and have been engaging with Canberrans. And those issues that I'm passionate about and feel I have a value add to bring into Parliament are the things that Canberrans are really wanting. Thank you, Kim, and thanks for correcting me on the uh, on the majority issue. I shouldn't know that. Um, I want to ask Rex, um, in your time in the Senate, do you spend as much time negotiating with your fellow crossbenchers 
compared with, say, government and opposition parties? Or would you, so where do you do most of your caucusing other than your office? Do you find that you, do you find that uh, you have to deal with not just the major party who's in, in government, but the other independents and uh, minor parties as much as them? Oh, look, it, 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 there's actually signalling that goes on uh, that helps you sort of triage and manage the way that's done. So if a bill comes through and uh, it's non-controversial, so uh, Labor and Liberal are both supporting it, in actual fact, uh, the, the crossbench never really uh, spend too much time on it. We might look at it to see whether there's an amendment that is required uh, how we how we might make it better, but we know that it's going to pass in some form or or another. Uh, sometimes bills can be controversial, um, but the government is negotiating with the Labor Party, uh, and uh, in those circumstances, again, uh, we, we generally don't uh, get too sort of deeply involved because we have so much work that we that, that we, we we have to do. Uh, when the crossbench uh, get enlivened in terms of uh, getting active on a bill is when the government realises they can't get Labor support. And if it were an industrial relations bill, for example, they just know they wouldn't get it anyway, so they start very early, the government will pick up the phone and say, we want to talk to you about a bill. That's the first signal that uh, the, the Labor Party is, is not supporting. So you know, it, the, the government doesn't call you on every bills. They only call you when they think they need you. Okay. Uh, and, and that's when that's when you apply, um, uh, uh, you know, t- when you allocate time to make sure that you might uh, attend that particular Senate inquiry. You get, uh, you, you get all the stakeholders. Uh, they'll contact you anyway because they're alive to the fact that it's a bill where the crossbench will make the decision. And... Uh, we, we will do the numbers ourselves. Um, you know, it's normally pretty obvious. The government has 36. The opposition has uh, 35. Uh, they need 39 votes, votes to get uh, across the line. And so amongst the crossbench, we then work out where people are sitting as well. Uh, and uh, sometimes there's even a competition between the crossbenchers because sometimes you can leverage the government. Uh, you know, crossbenchers will not vote for something they don't. Uh, that they don't agree with and they will always vote for something they do agree with. But a lot of legislation is grey and in those circumstances, the government will in some sense shop around a little bit to find the least um, offensive uh, amendment to them that will get the bill across the line. So it's really, it's actually quite complicated uh, and sometimes if you're trying to press an amendment of a particular type because you think it's important to, to your constituents, uh, that might mean that you're hoping Jackie doesn't, uh, you know, Jackie Lambie doesn't uh, um, <laughs> strike a deal with the government first. But then there's other times when you absolutely work together as a team and, uh, and uh, uh, exercise the control. I could give a, a really good example of that. Um, when the government were trying to deal with a religious discrimination bill, which, of course, uh, in my view, is just a can of worms and completely unnecessary, you, you might recall the overnight sitting that they had. Um, I was sitting in the Senate chamber at 7 o'clock on that, uh, on that evening. Uh, Katie Gallagher, Labor senator, came up to me and said, Rex, what are you going to do when this bill comes to the, to the House, to the Senate tomorrow? And I said, well, there's no, there's no debating time for the government tomorrow. I can't see how it's going to pass, and I'm certainly not going to move any guillotine motions. And she said, well, I'm not. We're not going to do that either. That was the Labor position. I quickly turned around and talked to Jackie. Uh, within about th- three or four minutes, uh, with Sterling Griff and, indeed, Larissa Waters, we worked out we had the numbers to make sure that bill was not going to go anywhere uh, because it's not the Prime Minister that controls uh, what happens in the Senate. It's not even um, the Simon Birmingham. It is, you know, the Senate that decides. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, so in that instance, we knew that that evening uh, that it wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> the, you know, the House continued to sit sure. uh, uh, you know, until 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, but it was actually dead at 7 o'clock the night before. Okay. Well, it's a bit like the government sounds in that case a bit like um, uh, adult children, you know, they only hear from when they want something. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the Senate, uh, in terms of legislation, um, uh, and leverage, it's always about numbers. It's a numbers game. 
yeah. and uh, you know the government uh, will seek to get the numbers, and they'll try and find the, if you like, the cheapest cost Quick. to them. Quickest way through. Okay, mm-hmm. I want to go around the panel. Sorry, just to, just, I I want, just gonna, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Kim. Just to follow up for Rex's point about the disallowance of regulations, because that's another really important value add that you have brought in, Rex, in terms of those um, uh, scenarios. But I, I'm happy to let it go. But it's, it is an interesting point of the leverage, leverage and yeah. power. Well, I can just tell you there that, um, look, a couple of disallowances that I've moved uh, were in support of charities, in support of proxy advisors, and those disallowances were successful. Um, Sometimes there are issues where the Labor Party, uh, well, obviously the government is not going to disallow uh, regulation. Um, There might be times when the Labor Party looks at a regulation and they're internally conflicted, and so they won't do anything about it. Now, it turns out that any senator can move a disallowance, but within a party they won't because they stick uh, with party lines. And so just moving, uh, me moving a disallowance then forces the Labor Party to have a position. They have to then deal with it. Uh, And that's one of the benefits of of being independent. You don't have a a party line to follow. You just act in, in good conscience, but it actually then causes a focus on an issue that otherwise would not have occurred. Yep, thank you for that. Now, um, I know there's one of the things you're going to have to get used to if you get in there is the enormous workload because unlike everyone else, you have to be across every brief and every area of policy. But um, I'm going to go around quickly to the panel and just get you to nominate the two most important issues that you see facing uh, the country for this election. I know it's an invidious choice sometimes, but... Um, just so people will get a sense of what your priorities are for the in 15 days' time. So, if it's, Leanne, can we start with you? What are the what are the two most important critical issues for you um, from a Tasmanian point of view? Um, integrity, climate, and housing. That's three. I know. Okay, in, that's fine. In, so, um, in which or in that order? Oh, look, they're so in, they're so um, intermingled, aren't they? Because I was speaking to a climate activist the other day and she said, for you know, for, that's been working on climate for 30 years and she said uh, housing is the most important thing, which shocked me. And I said, why do you say that? And she said, well, how do you think someone's going to get engaged on saving the planet when they don't even have a roof over their head and such a basic human right as shelter? And I get very frustrated by um, politicians always talking about the housing crisis, but it's not a crisis. A crisis is something that occurs, that happens, that you have no agency over. This is the the current housing um, um, thing, crisis, um, is actually what was always going to happen because of successive government legislation and policies. So housing is very important. It is you can't attack, you can't look at climate and if you don't have a parliament that has integrity. You can't have um, a parliament that fixes climate change when they're being funded directly by fossil fuel companies. And also have some at some times have been in the parliament that long, they don't even realize that they've recognized that they're compromised. Yeah. So um, you know, what do we do with those people? Take them on a retreat and tell them about what integrity are and have self-reflection? I don't know. No, other choices get more independence in. So I actually, for those three things, and there's so many issues, but I can't see how you deal with one without dealing with the others. Yep. Um, and my last point quickly is that um, for a lot of young people I speak to, they're outra- completely outraged and I just they have got palpable anger at the fact that they'll never be out of a renting trap. Mm-hmm. And within that rent, you know, they'll never own a home. And they are looking at a situation where they don't even think that they'll be able to have secure housing or rentals. So how do we say to those young people, well, we're leaving you with an insecure climate and you're not even going to have a roof over your head while that happens. Um, It's outrageous. Thanks. Okay. Now, Susan, um, I know the housing crisis is pretty bad in um, because I'm also from Victoria, but um, what are your two or three most important issues? I'm going to just go back one step. I'm one of the 12 people that founded Voices for Indi. And we've done a lot of listening over a long period of time now, over that 10 years, and I've continued doing that listening. So I did a recent poll, Integrity and Climate Action, A Fairer and Kinder Australia and Natural Resilience are things that are not negotiables for me. Housing fits in that fairer and kinder Australia. 
They did the poll as long as as well as kitchen table conversations right across the state to say what really matters. And the same answer came up about integrity. That unless we use that as shining light, we will, it's really hard to work on the other pieces of the puzzle. So integrity and climate action, absolutes. And really, it, when we make decisions, we have to make them that stick and we have to make them for the good of others, not to serve ourselves. Mm. David, are they the similar to yours or do you have something slightly different? No, pretty similar here. Integrity, housing, climate and uh, territory rights here in the ACT. Uh, so it, integrity, it, you mean, by integrity, I'm assuming you mean a, a commission against corruption or something equivalent to that? Uh, the, the four things I think, integrity, integrity commission, looking at political donations, truth and political advertising and restoring funding to the Auditor General and the ANAO. Yeah, look, I think that issue of uh, political donations particularly uh, is really only if it comes up at elections for obvious reasons, but it's really one that no major party wants to grapple with. It's um, so corrosive. And, and you know, finally, we're actually having a conversation about it and hearing about it now that there's independence threatening the, the status quo. So I, I'd be really keen to keep that conversation going and actually actually deal with it. Yep. So that, that's, that, those sort of go together, Trans, uh, transparency, greater integrity, a commission looking on cor- corruption and reform of uh, donation, political donations, I think is, uh, they're really, they're really uh, all together, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Jane, what about you? What's your, uh, I know uh, climate change is probably, uh, and integrity are probably your two too as well, are they? Very much so, but I also would include poverty and inequality, and that includes education, um, the lack of funding for the schools that teach the most disadvantaged, and of course, women's safety and financial security. Um, Women are running as independents. Women are running for positions. They're disrupting this election. They are incredibly lacking in the conversation. No one is talking about women's rights. And we've just seen Roe versus Wade. Uh, looking like it's going to be overturned in the US. Women's rights are always, um, they're always equivocal. They're always bargained with. We worry about 10,000 coal miners' jobs. What about the 51% of the population's right to earn an income? We need, you know, free universal uh, childcare. We need removal of tax incentives so that women can actually go back to work and earn a decent income so they don't end up poor when they're old. Um, Those kinds of things really exercise me as well. Yeah, I'm surprised that domestic violence hasn't received more attention in this election. It really uh, is epidem- epidemic levels. And uh, no one seems to think that it's an educational issue as well as uh, uh, providing, you know, obviously refugee, refuges and, uh, and other remedial issues. But surely this is an educational issue. And we have an extraordinary situation in this country where more money is now spent on private schools than on um, the university sector. Yep. Uh, from the Commonwealth, as far as which is pretty. It's, 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 it's more money on private schools than all 37 of Australia's universities combined. It's been so for quite some time, and the universities only get their money from the federal government. Yep. Rex, um, are you, uh, have you changed your focus from the, over the period of uh, you've been in, in the Senate, or are you uh, pitching a slightly different priority list for you now? Well, I'm. Um, um, but speaking from someone inside the Senate, so I have the benefit of, of, of the experience. Um, I care about all the things that, that uh, all the candidates have talked about. Uh, and, you know, there's other things like manufacturing that are important to me. Uh, there's there's uh, you know, resilience, uh, you know, climate change, integrity. All of these things are important. Uh, you use the word priority, but in actual fact, it doesn't work like that. What happens is... Mm-hmm. Um, you have a sort of this sort of temporal um, uh, wave that sort of rolls through the Senate. You, you can say, right, right, climate change is important to me and on a Tuesday night I'm going to do an adjournment speech and stand up and, and say something about, about that. Um, it, it, then there's a debate on... Um, on uh, industrial relations, and you you you, know, then, you then go and contribute uh, to that. You then, you might say, well, a really important issue for me is manufacturing, uh, and I'm going to put up a private members bill that will get a discussion going, that will get an inquiry going, even. Uh, but uh, it, that that's really still a discussion. When you see a government bill going through the the Senate, um, that actually you can hook some of your issues to. 
that's often when you're the most powerful and uh, because the government want to get that bill through and you can if you can attach something to it then it creates a dilemma where it uh, has to go back to the house and they would have to reject uh, their um, uh, their their own bill or accept that uh, there's an amendment sometimes it bounces backwards and forwards but that's an example of where um, an opportunity arises to actually get a real change and so it's not so much that you go in there and say i'm going to have a priority you go in there with a list of things that you do and then you pick the tools that uh where you can push an issue along or even change cause a change on an issue and 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 sometimes the timing of that is out of your out of your control you just have to be ready for it to happen so you so in summary you have a whole bunch of really important issues that are that you have sitting there and then you uh, you you exercise uh, the tools uh, a, a, uh, as the opportunities present themselves to push those issues. Okay. And Kim, I think you're the, the lucky last on this one. But I wanted after this, I just wanted to have a very quick um, say about the media um, and before opening it up to questions. So if those who are hanging in for questions, we'll get to you in a, in a very short time. But Kim, your two or three priorities. <laughs> So I was going to pick up on the theme that Rex just did, which is that I plan to do many things um, within those three years and perhaps life of balancing doing a lot of different things in a job as an academic, as a teacher, as a writer, as an advocate means that that sense of being able to do more than one thing at, uh, at one time is important here. But I've already drafted a bill to increase the number of Senate representation for the ACT, and that is about directly and better representing the needs, including issues to do with housing, education and so forth for the ACT. But the two key issues that have really driven me to want to be in there now doing something are integrity and climate and when, or three really and women's safety. But I do see integrity as fundamental to everything else. And for me, it's not only an ICAC, but it's actually restoring the fundamental liberal democratic principles that are there that were formed to be able to provide for accountability and a culture of responsibility to the people. Things like um, FOI, things like the independence of an AAT, the, the funding of the Ombudsman, they are all mechanisms that have been there but have been eroded to such an extent that we now, as a matter of urgency, need an ICAC. But the ICAC should only be there as a safety net. And on women's safety, I see that linking back into Parliament. We need more women in Parliament totally committed to the Setting the Standards report and not only committed to the Setting the Standards report, but really evaluating how we have a more diverse parliament and we need independence in there pushing for a greater diversity of representation for all Australians. Okay, thank you. Um, the media, interestingly, the media, because um, in a sense there's good news and bad news for you. The good news is that the media is going after you all. That's the bad news because uh, you've got a chance of winning. If they're ignoring you all, uh, then they'd, um, you'd, you'd be worried that perhaps you weren't uh, of any concern. But as we've seen, particularly in the House of Representatives, where there are Liberal seats that are blue ribbon in play for the very first time in their history. And this is a quite extraordinary thing. You can name, you know, Goldstein, Goldstein, uh, sorry, uh, Kim, Goldstein, Kuyong, North Sydney. Um, uh, some of these other seats are who have never, ever been anything other than Liberal strongholds are in play. And this seems to me to be, uh, it can't be an issue that's confined to the House of Representatives. It must be an issue that flows into the Senate as well. So the, you're likely in the, in the next two weeks, you're likely to get a lot more attention than you otherwise might have as a result. However, a lot of that attention, as Jane will tell, uh, I'm sure, is very, will know is it can be extremely critical which is a good and bad thing because if they weren't bothered with you, they wouldn't bother trying to attack you. But um, the media is going to play an important role. Um, it's under, there's, there's a lot of criticism of the way the media has covered, have covered this election so far. I really don't see it improving dramatically over the next two weeks or changing because it appears that the major news corporate medias have got their own candidates they want to push and their own parties that they want to get in back into power. And the independents are, in a sense, a, a thorn in the side of that endeavour. Um, it may be that we have balance of power or 
what sometimes you know, disparagingly called a hung parliament in both houses, uh, which will be extreme, will make life really interesting for people like me, but it might not be so comfortable for the party, the majority party in the House of Reps. So uh, I'll just quickly go around to start with Susan. What do you think the, um, uh, what's, what's, what have you noticed? Uh, perhaps you just reflect on how the media, how you've been affected by it, or did it, has the media treatment of you or of the campaign surprised you? Um, the media treatment of the Senate and the Senate candidacies has surprised me. I think we're relatively invisible in the Senate, and yet there's been a lot of emphasis on the green, or, or sorry, on the teal independence. <clears throat> What does worry me are a number of things. We've slipped dramatically in world press rankings, in our own transparency and in how the press works, that ultra concentration of the media, the fact that there's been external um, intervening in the press. And if we think of Annika Smetters, if we think of the ABC raid, if we think of um, the freedom of the press not being guaranteed in our constitution, and also that we've now got some fairly harsh national security laws which are stopping that freedom of the press. All of those things in general have to be looked at. We are served well by diversity, diversity across the Senate as well as diversity in our press, but the real freedom of the press in order to be able to speak. So my own experience is, is that the Senate is almost invisible as a contest in, in Victoria but that we have these really critical issues that we need to address to get a better relationship between the media and our broader community. Jane, does that uh, sort of align with your thoughts? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I really think we, we're in deep trouble in Australia because 70% of our media is controlled by the Murdoch press and that is um, really uh, corrosive to our democracy. Um, it wouldn't be good if it was controlled by anyone, but it is particularly bad that, in my opinion, that it happens to be controlled by them because they're not really a news organisation, in my view, anymore, uh, uh, which is really sad. So one of the first things I'd be really interested in looking at is a media diversity inquiry and a look at how we could um, legislate to restrict media ownership so that it is more diverse because... Uh, you know, it is, has, it is having a chilling effect on democracy, even without people say, oh, Rupert never tells us what to write. They don't, he doesn't have to tell. That's the, that's the essence of power is mm. nobody actually has to say or do anything. It's just everyone knows how powerful they are and so they dance around and second guess what it is they are allowed to say and not allowed to say. And this is so corrosive. So I think it's an absolutely urgent issue. Okay. Now, Rex, you get a fair bit of publicity on submarines for good reasons. And we've uh, managed to botch uh, the submarine procurements as badly as just about anyone could imagine. Um, do you find the same? Uh, is, is it as easy to get um, some comment, uh, some attention from the media on the election more generally, or are they still wanting you to focus on a specific issue? Um, look, uh, what, what I'll say is I do have an advantage as an incumbent, uh, and, I, and I have an advantage because I have worked with the media for the last four and a half years. You know, if I look at the media list in my phone, there's, there's probably close to four or 500 numbers um, and uh, ex an experienced media advisor. We know who to go to for particular stories. Uh, and often uh, journalists will, will, will want to uh, seek uh, or, or have a political paragraph in a story as well. And that's where uh, independents have a, have a really uh, good advantage in that, um, often the media will come to me because they don't have to wait for me to go through a caucus or, the, or you know, the government, uh, really, they can only go to the minister because all of the other backbenchers aren't allowed to comment uh, on, on, the, on a policy. They, they, they will ref always refer the media to the minister. Okay. And sometimes that happens in the opposition with shadows. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I would say the last two or three days I've probably done television two or three times. Uh, I've done radio probably seven or eight times and and part of that is because of that familiarity with the media because they want comments from a senator uh, yeah. and also uh, be, because uh, I'm putting out some interesting uh, ideas about what needs to uh, what needs to be done uh, and some of those ideas get traction sometimes you don't get traction 
uh, but uh, uh, with with some experience, uh, I, I do have uh, an advantage. Uh, I'd always like more media because that helps you. Uh, you know, television advertising is hugely expensive, so if you can get yourself on uh, Channel Nine or Channel Ten or or, or the ABC, or a four uh, page then, or a four page spread in the Herald Sun, yeah, yes, then then yeah, then, so. then that is very helpful. Um, so, <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. Leanne, are you getting any attention from the Hobart Mercury or the Launceston Examiner? Yes, we're very well serviced in Tasmania, 500,000 people and three daily newspapers. Um, I am in an interesting position because I used to actually do quite a lot of media work before I... Um, good evening, Quentin. Before I... Um, uh, you know, announced that I was going to be running for the Senate. And then as soon as I did that, then uh, then I lost all of, you know, I mean, they told me, like ABC said, Leanne, we can't have you on as a commentator anymore. Um, I didn't okay. get called. With me. And, be and before that, I was called a lot. But I knew that that was going to happen. And okay. then I think the strategy from the other parties was just not mention me, don't, you know, ignore me. But I don't know what's happened. But in the past week, I've been attacked by the Liberals. I've been attacked by Jackie Landie. Um, and there could be a dirt piece on one of my um, the members of my team in the Australian tomorrow. I'm hoping it won't be. I've tried to talk Matt Denham out of running it, um, but that it's just, you know it's um, so that's a very personal response. Yeah, I suppose. sure. No, no, that's what we want because uh, it is a it is a case by case basis. And David, yeah, uh, you've got the uh, Canberra Times as your only uh, newspaper there, but um, are you struggling to get any attention from the ABC? You know, there are a few more local uh, news sites, but it is hard. You know, the incumbents do get the lion's share of the media coverage. You know, they can do a re-announcement and get a front page. So as, a, as an independent, you're constantly looking at ways to insert yourself in the in the news cycle and, and have announcements and, and things to talk about. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge. And, yeah, I think... Without, uh, revert, without reverting to stunts, of course, which is the, this is the temptation, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want to be known for that, actually talking, no. about, talking about the issues. But, you know, it, it has been... It is strange that the sorts of things that the media wants to talk about, rather than talking about the actual issues, they're very hung up on, uh, you know, Climate 200 or thing, things of that nature. Yeah. And, Kim, finally, uh, you um, have the same problems, David? Well, I, I was actually going to say, and I, I think that actually the Canberra Times has been focusing on the Senate race because it's a real race, whereas here in Canberra, the lower house is, are all very strong Labor uh, seats and it's always been Labor and Liberal in the past, but there is a real sense that um, one of those seats is vulnerable. Okay. So I was going to say in comparison to the past, there has been actually quite a lot of attention on David and I running. And um, in addition, the Riot Act, which is another source, has a very large readership, online readership, ran a Senate candidates debate, which people can go and have a look at that's now online. And that was the only debate where we had Zed and Katie, um, Zed Sezelja, who's the Liberal current um, member, uh, Senator, and Katie Gallagher, the Labor Senator, together with me and David and Gennaro Gorongoran, the Greens, and in fact, UA, UAP representative. So I think Canberra is actually taking more attention because it's a real race and there is a real chance that one of us could win and that that could then, as Leanne said earlier, the ACT could be significant in, in that, you know, crossbench um, in terms of the balance of power for the whole nation. Okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll hand back to Hannah. I know who's got Quentin waiting for, patiently for his first question. So um, I'll hand back to you, Hannah, as the MC for the Q&A section. And... Uh, yeah, I'm sure that everyone's in good hands with uh, with you. And perhaps if we kick it off with, we're we going to kick it off with Quentin. I think so. Yes. Um, so for everyone else watching along at home, don't forget that if you have questions, pop them in the Q and A section, not in the chat. It will get lost if you put it in the chat. There is a special Q and A button that you can ask your questions in there. Um, but before we get to the written questions, yes, we do have a um a special guest here tonight who would like to put a question. Uh, to our panelists, uh, and it's uh, it's quite fitting that we have just come off the topic of journal journalism because Quentin De Dempster is uh, is a, a, an absolute veteran of Australian journalism. So I'll uh, I'll invite you, Quentin, to come on the camera and uh, ask a question. Uh, thanks, Hannah. Quentin from uh, Gadigal Land uh, here. Uh, congratulations and thanks for your courage and commitment to standing for the Senate. You're uh, 
uh, wish you had a, 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 a marketable, more marketable name saying uh, Senate educators using proportional representation of the Australian Senate to make the Senate what it should be uh, under our Westminster Australian version of uh, democracy. I'm desperately concerned because of the uh, uh, Putin's uh, invasion of Ukraine about what should be a complete unification of democracies against the authoritarians all around the world to make their democracies much more functional. But here in Australia, we're in the usual game of, uh, of disinformation and two-party vilification and smear and politics. Uh, thanks, Rex, for all you've done for the last uh, three years. Uh, you've talked about media. Your, your potential legislators... Uh, Rex, you've been a, a legislator and have had that inside experience. Uh, look, you could, you could legislate Uluru's statement from the heart, uh, whether it comes from the reps into the Senate. Uh, you could have a Bill of Rights. Uh, it's the way you write the bloody laws that's most important as legislators. Let's talk about the media because I'm uh, just as distressed as you about the, the disinformation, particularly from Rupert and, uh, and Lachlan. What practically, particularly after the Senate uh, inquiry into, into media diversity, what practically can we do to start, make sure that the Australian media doesn't go down the US Trumpist line? Well, the first thing, I might, if, I, if I might uh, uh, respond to that, is firstly to make sure that we protect the ABC mm -hmm. um, as, a, as the public broadcaster. We've got to make sure that they are properly funded. Um, uh, and, of course trying to support some of the uh, uh, smaller players in the market, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Michael West, the, uh, uh, you know, the Crikey, uh, there's, there's a whole range of different players out there. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, where, where the media could be better supported, and this is not about necessarily about Murdoch per se, but um, We've we've seen an absolute decline in the number of journalists because of all of the advertising revenue getting directed towards uh, Google and Facebook, who can narrow cast uh, an ad at uh, someone who they know will click on it, um, as opposed to TV, who have to broadcast and only five percent of the audience might be interested in the ad. Um, and so we've seen a lot of money drawn away from uh, from. Uh, 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 newspapers and and even television, uh, and that uh, has had the effect of uh, um, decimating uh, the the pool of, uh, of of journalists. You know, if I want a story run on a on a serious issue that will take uh, a reasonable amount of time, the only place I can go to is the ABC. They're the only ones resourced to do a proper detailed um, story. Very few other uh, it's outlets. Hours allow you to do that so um i just um yeah that that's something we can think you know that, that we we need to think about that the parliament did try to tackle that uh in this parliament um not as successfully perhaps as what it could have i would like to also uh go on with that rex where the work has been done through some good inquiries and some recommendations i think if there are more independents in the senate there is a chance to go back to some of that work and say what was missed, what did not get implemented that needs to come back up. It is quite hard to watch inquiry after inquiry every time the Senate is reconstituted. There is good work that is already done and I think that you know there's a lot of depth in that evidence-based work that we could go back to and bring back up once there are more independents. It is truly a job half done if we only get good independence into the lower house. We need to also do that into the Senate and then these discussions become really worthwhile and we don't just get legislation sitting or, or inquiries sitting without being taken forward. Can I just ask, uh, if you put up your hand, who's in favour of the Royal Commission into the Murdoch Empire? Mm. Okay. That's interesting um, because obviously this is uh, what Kevin uh, Rudd's been running with for a while now and it's certainly not going to happen under a, uh, a Liberal uh, government but it might, it might under a parliament where there's the balance of power. 
to be fair, um, Malcolm Turnbull and Kevin Rudd have joined forces, in fact, yeah. which is why it's so powerful, because it's two ex-Prime Ministers from the two opposing parties. And I think that this idea of a Murdoch Royal Commission is a very powerful one. I also agree with Susan. I am a bit sick of seeing wonderful Royal Commissions come up with terrific recommendations and then end up on a dusty shelf in somebody's office somewhere and that we should go back and revisit some of the things that uh, have been previously recommended. We used to have quite strict rules about media ownership and, uh, you know, if you own this many newspapers, you couldn't own a TV station, et cetera, et cetera. And those have all been watered down. And I think we ought to go back and relook at them um, because it is, you know, the concentration of media ownership is a real problem. And, yes, we're getting small uh, social media-based publications, The Guardian, The Saturday Paper. I know it's an actual paper, but nevertheless, and that's great, but we actually need to look um, much more at how we get a much bigger and more diverse media. We had a big explosion of women's media um, in the early, mid-2000s and 2010s. Disappeared. It's all gone. It's all died. Um, and this really upsets me because they had audiences, they couldn't get advertisers. And I just also add the theme of integrity. We talk about integrity mm. in government, but integrity should be for anyone who exercises public power and the media is a significant expression of public power. And so it should also be subject to the same integrity measures that we're talking about for Parliament and for any exercise of this. Great idea. Great idea. Okay. Well, um, oh, sorry. Um, no, go I ahead, Hannah. Go and um, take some more questions from the audience now. And um, I might start by combining two questions here. Um, Melanie says, as I understand it, an independent has never been elected to the Senate in New South Wales, and even the Greens only scrape through on preferences. Um, while attitudes are clearly changing with the teal wave in the lower house, how likely is it that a progressive independent will be elected in New South Wales or other larger states for that matter? And then an anonymous attendee also asks on top of that, what are states like New South Wales and other big states missing out on? <laughs> well, they're missing out on Jane for starters. Yeah, that's right. What, was there something about New South Wales that uh, mitigates against the election of an independent? The size. It's the size. Mm. It's the mm. number Sorry, of votes you have to get because it's a quota system. So the bigger the population, the larger the number of votes you have to get. And so that's one of the reasons it's never um, happened yet. Uh, but my view about it is, yep, it's a, it's a long shot. There's no doubt about that. It's a tough goal. But I feel strongly that if you only ever fight the fights you're sure you're going to win, then you're a bit of a wimp, really. Um, and uh, so I've taken it on. Um, and I also feel very strongly that if we get a progressive House of Representatives and we do get some of the teal independents in and they do pull uh, whichever party is in government further uh, to the left and action on climate change and things like that, if they hit a Senate which is dominated by UAP or uh, and Paul N. Hansen's One Nation and some more right-wing Liberal senators, perhaps like Erica Betts or Jim Mullen or whatever, uh, then nothing will change. And so it's important, even in New South Wales, to not allow the past to stop you hoping for the future. Can I just I say agree, that? Yeah. Jane, and also in... Sorry, could you just put up your hand if you've seen the Senate ballot paper for your state yet and or territory? You have. Is it as bad as it was last time? Is it Because the last time I in Victoria... It didn't even fit in the booth. You had to sort of go along the, the ledge and up the sides. It's only 17 columns this time in New South Wales, not 23. And I'm, I'm actually okay. Anthony Green, um, I had a back and forth with him on Twitter over this because he was outraged that I thought that, you know, I was more interested in democracy and, and, and as many people putting their hand up as they wanted and he was more interested in how the ballot paper fit. Which, I mean, I'm paraphrasing and we had a laugh about it. Not, not By no means want to attack Anthony Green. But um, just I really want to congratulate both Jane and Susan because this is a hard gig to run in the Senate and I think it's relatively easier for me and um, David and Kim in terms of who we've got to get around and see. Um, you know, I know just even trying to get Get across the state in Tasmania it's, we've probably got the lowest amount of votes that you have to get to get in the Senate and I'm finding this completely overwhelming and daunting and I'd 
echo what Jane says. I mean, you miss out 100% of the shots you don't take. So, and each time that we do something that's good for democracy and good for women and good for integrity, I feel like we're a breaking wave on the beach and every time that wave crashes, the tide is coming in um, and we need to be behind it and propelling that water and that wave along. And well done to Susan and Jane. I've just got so much respect for you. Can I just add there, Vida Goldstein never got into Parliament. Mm. And yet she has a seat named after her. Mm. Can, I, can I also say that the um, on the Senate ballot, the party name is at the top. Of my, I'm, I'm right in saying that, aren't I? Yep. Which um, fundamentally makes it different from the House of Representatives ballot where it's in smaller font after the name of the candidate, I think. Is Correct. How, is how Correct. It works. So visually having a name as a party um, or calling yourself the Jane Caro party or whatever. You, you've got to really actually have to have a brand, don't you? There's no way around that problem, that question. You can't just say, I believe in, you know, I'm standing as me. You've got to sort of almost sell yourself as a brand, as a one-person party, yeah? Um, Scott, yeah. I really need to answer this. The, the, the system has been fundamentally set by parties to keep parties in power. Yes, we, but David, a lot of people have had to go through the process of setting up a party. I was um, invited by Voices for the Senate to actually run with them. They were a day short of getting their final um, work done before the, the election was called. I am now in Group T, T for transparency and independent to a T. That's all I get is a, a square box above the line. It is highly disadvantageous. People have to do their homework, but they've got to know. And like Leanne, every single step is a foundational step. Voices for the Senate will be registered as a party after the election. That's a foundational step. Then there are other foundational steps about building awareness, knowing how the Senate works, doing its education work, and 100% with Jane, every shot you don't take is the shot you miss. Rex, what's your uh, brand on the top of the Senate ticket in South Australia? Uh, mine will say Rex Patrick team. So I've set up a party not to conquer the world, but just to make sure I'm above the line um, because that's uh, it's very hard to get elected below the line. Uh, I was just going to add, uh, you know, obviously numbers are, are difficult for New South Wales. I've got to get something like 150,000 votes. Tasmania, it's a lot less. New South Wales, I don't know, Jane, exactly how much it is. It's probably half a million. Yeah, um, at least that. Uh, of that cool. order, if it, it, I just just make this observation, uh, if you look at the Senate makeup now, the Senate is made up of either well-branded parties, being Liberal, Labor, or the Greens, or well well-branded names: Jackie Lambie, Pauline Hanson, uh, Nick Xenophon, uh, previously, hopefully Rex Patrick, but uh, you know that's the nature of the beast. Um, uh, the, so so that, that's the first observation. The second thing I'll say is that um, uh, only about, I don't know, somewhere between 20 and 30% of the population are actually engaged in watching politics. And it's the other 70% that decide. Uh, you know, and, and they can often just default to, uh, to the brand, the, the brand of, of Labor, Liberal, Green. Yeah, uh, and that makes it very, very difficult for yeah. independents. Yeah, David, what are your what's your brand? As I, I, I don't like using the word, but I know you, it's almost unavoidable. Just David Pocock. We had some funny exchanges with the AEC when we were registering the the party about just having a name, but it's it's perfectly, uh, perfectly okay according to the rules. Okay. Whereas I'm Kim for Canberra. Okay. I've got a nice short name like Rex, so it even fits within my logo. I've reason. Yes, I know. The, and the, that's, you've got one advantage in that you're not the only reason, person of reason. That's right. Exactly. You know, though, you do actually have to have more than one person running to be above the line. That's the other aspect of it, which is really interesting. So it's not only at the party, but the above the line is for grouped candidates. So yes. if you're a single yes. candidate, you'd still be below the line even if you're a party. So I have Kim Hoon, who is a fellow um, academic and um, public individual here in Canberra, and there are two Kims for Canberra. <laughs> and they did relax, I think, the voting. If people who vote below the line 
you don't actually have to fill out every box now, do you? I think that's it's only one of twelve. Yeah. But okay. also, Kim would know this, or everyone would know this. It's registered. It's two thousand dollars that you have to pay um, to run a candidate. So we had to come up with, I think, twelve or fourteen thousand dollars. We've got three on the Senate ticket in Tasmania. We're not all Leanne's, but we are a Leanne, a Linda, and a Lara for Lutruita. Um, but so that's six thousand dollars, and for small unfunded parties, that's a lot of money to come up with. And then we've what's got your party a, name, Leanne? Uh, the local party. So we've got two two in um, South Australia and on the Senate ticket, three on the Senate ticket here, and then two in the House of Reps in Braddon and Franklin. So, I mean, that's actually quite, and they're all really quality candidates, and that's quite extraordinary, I think, for a party that wasn't even really an idea 18 months ago. Yep. And we've got Jane, the wonderful Hannah, who is emceeing this, and oh, Di great. Diana Ryle on our ticket. Yes, Hannah is number two on the ticket. Okay. And Diana, Diana Ryle, yeah. Okay, um, Hannah, you so, want to ask another question? Or get another yeah, question? Yeah, absolutely. We... Um, so, so Gwen, who actually there's lots of people in here. So uh, Gwen and, uh, oh, goodness, Sue and many, many, many other people in the chat want to know where all of the candidates <laughs> stand on the Indu card. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. I was actually um, talking to the media about this the other day and I did a little tweet out. So I was um, I was a mother at 16 and I was on welfare and my daughter's now master's educated. She's in a 40 or she's just turned 40. Um, and the two things that she always says to me is, Mum, thank you for never making me feel poor and thank you for making me feel like I could do anything that I wanted. And I can tell you now I would never have been able to achieve that if I had have had to have walked. I know I was on a pension at 16 with her, and if I had to have had to walk into a supermarket with a card that basically said, look at us, we're poor, how on earth would I ever have been able, it was hard enough as it was, to make this wonderful child um, know that she's valued and can reach her full potential. I am so against the Indu card, um, be both just morally and ethically, but also obviously from my own experience. Um, I can't, I just think it's a, just get rid of it. It's also the, it's the privatisation of welfare and oh, that totally. is really, really scary. And it also is about, it replicates coercive control. It is exactly yes. the same as a husband controlling the spending of his wife and many of the people in the in the current test sites uh, get on the Indu card because they are escaping violent relationships. And then what do they find? That they escape one set of violent relationships and coercive relationships, which is an incredibly courageous thing to do, to find themselves in a coercive control relationship with our government. It should be got rid of. It should never, ever have been brought in. I am not opposed to it necessarily as an opt-in. If there are some people in some communities who find it works for them, then they can choose it if that's going to work. But as a compulsory, one size fits all, absolutely pernicious. David, I'll just you, say that. Uh, oh, Rex, sorry, Rex and David then. Yep. Sorry, just, just, just for the record, I voted against the injury card uh, for perhaps two reasons or two two reasons, uh, both sides of the ledger. Uh, you know, I agree with what uh, the, the the other candidates have said, uh, but also from the government side, they were unable to produce any data that showed that it worked anyway. Okay. So um, uh, that was a case that there were two two sets of negatives uh, for the card. Okay. David? Yeah, don't, don't support it. For me, it's about dignity, and I, I don't see how cashless welfare does that. Okay. Good on it your like it's, probably, it's, it's probably the end of, I'd say it's probably uh, given the likely composition of the Senate or the, the most likely composition of the Senate. I think it's probably dead, but um, we'll see. Um, we'll, we'll have to hope that, um, yes, that people, some people in the Senate change their mind because I know it was a Tasmanian. It was Jackie that Jackie Lambie that um, helped get that through. So, yeah. but I think she's changed her mind. Uh, now, so uh, I, I just want to make sure I represent the truth here. Jackie voted against it uh, in uh, in the last vote. It got through uh, as a trial on the basis of One Nation and uh, Senator Sterling Griff. So Jackie voted I'll, against it. Thanks, Rex. I stand corrected. Mm. I thought she voted for it. It's hard to keep track of all of these things. But obviously... I know. This was, this was through I, discussion I through that. Her. Yeah. 
Hannah, we've we probably got a chance for two more questions, you think? Yeah, um, I've just had a, a message through from um, one of the organisers of tonight as well saying that feel free to go on for another 10, 15 minutes okay. if people feel up to it because um, I know you're all very busy people, but we also have some wonderful questions here, <laughs> um, including an anonymous question here who, um, who that says climate has been raised as an issue by everyone here tonight, but what exactly does climate action mean for you? What do each of you actually want to see specifically in terms of climate action? Uh, the electrification of Australia, um, Saul Griffiths plan, which uh, makes an enormous amount of sense and promises to reduce emissions, something like 70, 75% by 2030. Um, there's so many things we could do. Uh, we just need the political will to do them. Uh, to reduce um, carbon emissions much faster than we're doing now. Uh, green hydrogen, I, I just did a climate uh, smart energy council um, uh, panel this afternoon and there were so many uh, ideas and projects and possibilities being put up. Uh, all we need is a target, a, a sensible and rapid target, not 2050, and the will to do it. I get, so I get the sense that from the independents in the House of Representatives that are being targeted by, sorry, the seats that are being, the incumbents in the seats that are being targeted by the independents, the so-called teal independents, I get the sense that their heart is not really in their own government, their own party's policy on this. Um, I'm referring particularly yeah. to people like uh, Frydenberg and Sharma, who clearly would be far closer to their uh, their uh, rival's position if only they were allowed to say what they really believe. And it's, I... uh, it strikes me as the party itself is really their major problem here, is that they, and their heart is really not in it. You can see they made an announcement, I think it was today, about how many recharging stations they were going to create or something, build 200. And then someone said there was 80 in one particular venue in Europe. There are 80 charges that you could pull up to in one. They're talking about 200 for the country. Uh, so, you know, the, you get the sense that they're not really, you know, it's a, it's a half-hearted effort. But, I mean, that's just my reading of it. Kim? Yeah, so I think the point is that we've had decades of ideas of what we could do, but it's been the partisan stalemate that has been the block. And as you've just said, that within the parties, there's been the blockage of moving forward, even though there are people who are supportive of it. So what I have proposed is a landmark climate compact building on the 1983 National Economic Summit and Prices and Income Accord framework to take it out of parliament with parliament support to enlarge what has been happening over the last period with the Australian Climate Roundtable, amplify it, that has business, it has trade unions, it has the um, farmers, it has the broad range of stakeholders, but we amplify that with First Nations, we amplify that with the states and territories who have been doing actual work moving forward to come up by the end of this year with a, a negotiated way forward to it, a minimum 50% reduction of carbon emissions. Um, take that immediately back into parliament to be legislated with a budget. That is a structural way forward to ensure that we build on all the great ideas yeah. in a way where no one is left behind because of the engagement I'll, I'll, of all stakeholders. I'll Can bring I Quentin also... in here. In a second. Uh, just oh, I, I, I want to say that um, Tim Wilson is opposed to that, as you know, he made a wrote an op-ed in The Australian yesterday attacking, effectively attacking Zoe Daniel for taking this out of the hands of parliament, you know, ministers and uh, their officers. So um, you're right up against the uh, the wishes of the relevant minister at the moment, whether he remains the relevant minister or not, I don't know. Quentin? I just wanted to back up what I was going to say, put my hand up, uh, and then Kim uh, took the words out of my mouth in the sense that a summit uh, that decarbonisation is so vital now that, that to this country uh, and the way we are meant to be leading the world, we should be leading the world in our decarbonisation strategies because we're a wealthy first world country and we've had uh, huge post-war benefits from coal and iron ore and gas and we have to take uh, the awful decision of, uh, of unhooking ourselves from these revenue streams uh, again, I mentioned Putin and, and the whole um, uh, distortion or disruption of uh, commodity uh, uh, fossil fuel supply around the world. But we shouldn't be uh, daunted by that. We should be leading 
in our um, in in our the way we confronted as a country. And uh, if we get those ideas up, even without the support of a media, but get them people talking about them, that's the best thing you can do. And thanks, Kim, for uh, uh, putting that up. Uh, that would be vital for the Teal independence. And if any of you guys get into the Senate, uh, that would get the, it up as a part of a national debate. Yeah. Can we go to Rex and then we'll go to Susan? Yeah, look, I'll just offer, uh, again, an inside perspective, uh, although this can be seen from the outside. Uh, Scott, Scott made the point that there are many Liberals who actually uh, would support uh, climate change. And uh, I know... Uh, those Liberals, uh, uh, so they're not fictitious. The difficulty is that uh, the Liberal government is a coalition government and uh, the Nationals take a very strong sort of anti-climate, pro-coal, um, you know, every drop of water past, a, past an irrigation property is a wasted drop kind of approach to the world. And... Uh, the, so the problem for those moderate uh, liberals is that the, the, the choice becomes go down the climate path change uh, or not have a coalition. And it turns out that uh, uh, you know, politicians, uh, career politicians would rather maintain their position of power. Well, that's certainly uh, a priority over national interest in some instances. I think it's a fascinating argument that there are some of these moderate or progressive liberals are saying that if you don't vote us back, worse will come, uh, which doesn't really say a lot about what the, their own position and self-respect. But in a sense, what they're saying is, you know, we don't run the Liberal Party. So if you get rid of what effectively is the next generation of leaders of that party, because they're really all being targeted now, Lindsay, uh, Sharma, um, Frydenberg, um, Wilson, these guys expect to be the next generation of leaders. They'll be wiped out if the independents win. And uh, the, in a sense, they're right. They'll, uh, the, that will hand the party over to the paleo conservatives, and uh, you'll never see these issues even being, you know, the nationals will be delighted. But as you say, Rex, I think some of these guys hate the national party people more than they probably hate the independents and, uh, and some in the Labor Party because of what they're stuck with and what they can't do anything about. Susan? Three points. The first one absolutely follows up what Rex is saying. The Nationals have been the holdouts on this, and they're not reflecting the view of rural and regional Victoria or rural and regional Australia. That's where I live. That's where I work. We're much more progressive on farms and in businesses saying we've got to do something about it because we're also suffering the impacts quite dramatically. Second one is that we have renewable opportunities here. This is an economy opportunity, something to really be investing in, to be world leading in. We need to be looking at that. A lot of the work on local plough grids, local power plants, again, is really coming out. And Helen Haynes has got the local power plan. She's worked really closely with microgrids right across Victoria. And, and you know, there's so much opportunity. And the third one is transition. I, my primary work is in regional development. I have worked with um, communities up in the basin in Queensland and they are already thinking ahead. They're not waiting for the government to make up their minds. They're not waiting for a, a company to make up their minds. They're saying, how do we transition? How do we create a better future for ourselves, our communities, our workforce? What's the transition we need to do? So I'm totally um, want to see something going through. I think we start with a starting point. Zali Stegel has drafted some good legislation. Yep. At least put it into the parliament to debate, then those amendments or the inquiries yep. or the, the fine tuning takes place. But there's work already done. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, because it's really important to hear from the, the regions who are unfairly characterised as dragging the chain on these issues when, in fact, in many ways they're leading the charge, as you say, not waiting for um, you know, leadership from the centres, the metropolitan centres. Well, uh, I'm a so farmer. Really I'm a farmer and we can see climate change happening in front of our eyes and so can all our neighbours. So mm -hmm. it, it's a very bizarre position the Nationals are taking. I can only assume that they are championing 
mining and fossil fuel companies rather than actually regional and rural Australians. I think they also want, they want a job afterwards, don't they? I mean, yeah, that's them, usually it. They, a lot of them are just lining oh. up jobs to go into consultancies that they uh, will slip into straight after. And I the- think also that one of the, like the question was what are we going to do about climate? Like what do we want to actually do about it? And I think some of the suggestions put forward have been fantastic from, from you know, from everyone who's spoken. And I love Kim's idea. Um, I, I do agree on the Zali Stegel. But what we also did was what happens with the national debate just then, and that is that we all drifted into but what about the nationals? What's wrong with the nationals? What And I, my sense of frustration around climate stuff after being involved with it for three decades is that three decades ago, I felt like there was this weight on my shoulder and in my head because I didn't know how to overcome the problem of climate. I didn't know what we were going to do about technology because I'm not a technology focused person. I didn't know how we could transition our economy. But for the past 10 years, I haven't felt a weight. I have felt like the kid just before Christmas that can't wait for Santa to come down the chimney, but something's stopping him, right? So um, I, I, to, to my mind, um, if the question is, what are you going to do about climate? It's more like, what isn't there to do about climate? I mean, we have to change everything and there's a job for everyone in this. And there are so many solutions out there. I would like to spend most, of, I don't mean here now, but I would like to see the national debate much more focused on all of the things that we can do. And in a lot of ways, that's what community is doing. Yeah. And, and businesses are well as well, because, you know, community agitates and business innovates and then finally politicians legislate. And I feel that's where we're at at the moment. And we're going to push this legislation through at the next parliament. Um, and if we don't, we are cooked. This is the last parliament that we have that has an opportunity to make real change on the worst impacts of climate that we've already um, uh, you know, cooked in. And I think we can do it. And I actually find that it's very exciting. And a lot of it is Murdoch and all the problems with the press that we've just talked about, who rather spend time, to, you know, analysing who wore what sock and what the National Party might do tomorrow or what my, you know, campaign staffer did 25 years ago. Um, I, think, I think if nothing is done in this parliament about tangibly about mm-hmm. climate change, there's going to be a very angry group of young Australians who are going to wreak their vengeance on uh, at the at the following election because it's gone from the margins to the centre and if it's not going to be yep, taken yep. up seriously and it's not seen as being act, acted on in a tangible way, um, that generation, which is my son and daughter's generation, they're in their twenties, mm-hmm. is going to be extremely angry. Oh uh, sure, not, not just but passive, the planet will be, yeah, but but I, the planet will be angrier. But they're going to take it out on uh, the people who didn't do what they wanted they, they were expected to do. Rex, sorry. Can yeah, you... I was just going to say that, um, you know, I, I brought up the nationals mostly to just say here's where one of the barriers lie uh, politically. Yeah. Uh, I think that there are uh, technology solutions uh, everywhere that that assist in relation to climate change. Uh, but I, I'll give an interesting example that I can't understand even from a political perspective, and that is electric vehicles. Um we're not asking the government to make a decision about electric vehicles because that decision has been made by the car manufacturers and indeed other jurisdictions where they've banned the uh, the, the sale of in, internal combustion engine cars after a particular time frame. So that is going to happen. We are going to get electric cars. Um, uh, all that happens is when the government doesn't uh, recognise that uh, and you know, there's so many good things about electric cars in terms of carbon footprint, but also pollution. No, no, no pollutants Noise. that come from an exhaust. Uh, no, that they actually help with fuel security. Uh, we don't require um, uh, uh, fuel uh, storage uh, if if we if we transition to electric. We um, the, the, they're actually more efficient, so they they actually help productivity. You would think that the Liberal government might uh, might, might support that. But just, it, you know, it's coming. And the, and the fact that the government doesn't come up with a, a, a policy that says, you know, we're going to not have uh, internal combustion uh, engine cars after 2035, whatever the number is, means that we keep having buildings in the cities, apartment buildings built without charging stations uh, in in the car parks, and we don't have um, 
pe- uh, companies investing in uh, fast charges along along our freeways. We don't. Tr- we're not training the 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 uh, new type of mechanic or electrician that needs to be uh, in uh, the Toyota or the BMW or or um, uh, you know, Ford uh, ca- uh, car. Uh, yard uh, maintaining vehicles. So that's an example where it's really, really bizarre because the the, the decision has been made already, and the government has has just ignored what's actually happening. Yep. Look, we've uh, we've run already uh, what half an hour over time, haven't we, Hannah? So I think we, we might have we to have. Um, draw I it to a know, close. We haven't actually we haven't heard from David yet on climate. Oh, sorry, change. David. David yeah, would sorry. You, would you like to jump in and tell us um, about what is important to you for climate change? And then Scott, I think after that we can probably wrap up. Okay, sorry, David. My 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 error. No problem, Scott. Uh, thanks, Hannah. I mean, this is I think this is the perfect issue of something being politicised. We need a pragmatic way forward. In my eyes, that's something like uh, Zali Stegel's climate bill to actually set a meaningful target and then to bring the solutions that Saul Griffith and others are working on in terms of electrification and really importantly, ensure that the cost savings happen at the household level. People have to be saving money from cheaper electricity, from more efficient appliances, from being able to afford an electric vehicle. All this technology is coming the task over the next few years is to do what we've done for rooftop solar, which is a a raging success story here in Australia. We've got to do that for for heat pumps, for batteries, for electric vehicles, so that every Australian can afford one and no one's left behind. It's it's a really exciting uh, challenge. And I think once we actually start to get beyond the politicization and and the fear mongering, things will start to move very quickly. The technology is there already. Yeah, I think, look, that important point about depoliticising it is very unfortunate that the previous election, uh, the government made an issue about electric vehicles at, on weekends and not being able to tow caravans. And uh, that really, to introduce a political dimension to it, basically meant that stymied confidence in investment in those, in, in those industries locally. I mean, it's going on, as you say. I mean, the, Imagine the EU can't make decisions on anything, but they've actually introduced restrict. You know, I think, as uh, Rex was saying, a time limit on how long you can still sell um, internal combustion engine vehicles. Now, if the EU can do it, surely Canberra can. And you know, yeah. meanwhile, we don't. We're the only developed country without emission standards for vehicles. So, of course, yeah. we're last in the line for electric vehicles. So, even if you want an EV at the moment, it's a six to twelve month wait time you know, yes we, we can yes. do so much better and i think thankfully the conversation has shifted um attitudes have shifted since the last election business has sort of cracked on and i think everyone is waiting for politicians to finally lead and yeah. or catch know, up first <laughs> we, we've we've seen the effects you know yep. the bushfires the floods um yep. yeah people are keen keen for change okay well, look, uh, it's been a very uh, stimulating and, and com- by contrast to what we're experiencing in the uh, mainstream and corporate media these days, particularly uh, civil and constructive and informative discussion. It's, it, it actually, I, I was noticing some of the comments in the chat group saying, what a pity this can't be replicated in the normal media channels. You know, why is it only able to be done uh, in this format? Um, And so much of it is just so much of what goes on in the mainstream media is just petty point scoring and personal attacks and no one gets informed about anything really in the process. So um, hopefully that uh, not only will EVs become more exciting and more widely accepted, but this sort of format of a discussion will move from being in Zoom chats to more mainstream discussion. And uh, Well, hopefully on the floor of the Senate. Yeah, on the floor of the Senate. So, um, before I hand you back, before I hand you back to Anna, Hannah, I'll just say I wish you all uh, obviously the best of luck in 15 days. Um, It's a stressful time for everyone, uh, but particularly for you, as I know, um, it's a bit like um, you know, I guess running out for your first game of rugby. You never quite know who's going to hit you first uh, (laughs) from the back of the head or the or the side or the front. But um, as long as you realise the the hits are coming it means you must be having an impact. Otherwise, no one would bother with you. So 
Um, if that's the case, you're doing something and you're upsetting someone. Judge, judge your success by the enemies that you've accumulated along the way. So good luck on, uh, on the 15th. Uh, right. Sorry, on the, in 15 days, on the 21st. And uh, perhaps just hand you back to Hannah to uh, say farewell and log off. Thank you so much for that, Scott. Um, so for uh, everyone at home, if you would like to come back and watch this webinar again, uh, it is available right now straight away on the Reason Australia YouTube page. And we will also be giving a copy to all of our panelists here tonight as well. So um, you just follow your, your fave on the socials and I'm sure that each of our panelists here tonight will make that available to you through their channels as well. Um, but that's all for us. Um, thank you everyone so much. Thank you, Scott, for being a wonderful host. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Rex. Thank you, David. And thank you, Den uh, Quentin, for jumping in as well. Um, and have a wonderful night, everyone. And we'll see you thank next you, time. Thank you, Hannah. Good luck. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thanks, Jane, for Bye. organizing. Thank Thanks, you. Hannah. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.